Okay, um, welcome back everyone to, again, the dark side. So, um, away from 750 GV photons. Okay, so last time, the basic, so what I wanted you to take away from last time was that we said that if you had decay lifetimes somewhere in the general ballpark of what you'd expect from a dimension six high scale operator. So I will note that the error bar on here is very much in the exponent. But if you had decay lifetimes around that scale, or cross sections comparable to the thermal relic cross section, then we can exp then we can potentially probe that with reasonable with telescope detectors, i.e., telescopes of reasonable size and reasonable time periods. So this is sort of the well, part of the justification of indirect detection. And we also said that, in additionally, this cross sections, and I didn't really make the argument for decay lifetimes, but it can also be true for decays, this kind of process can have striking effects in the early universe. So today, what I want to do is focus more in on this side of the picture and ask, all right, if I have what, and talk about the signals that you might expect to see in photons, in neutrinos, or in cosmic rays. I want to talk a bit about what you would look for and the telescopes that we can use to look for them.
Now, in the course of doing this, as we talk about these potential signals, in particular the cosmic ray signals, we're also going to be talking about the backgrounds to other such searches. Then tomorrow, I'll go ahead and put all this together, show you the from the principles that we've worked out in the first two lectures, what that actually looks like in terms of present and constraints on dark matter annihilation and hints of signals. Again, as yesterday, please ask questions. Um, questions, are almost always, questions are almost always good. The, um, <laughs> in, my in my entire career, I've, I've seen one truly stupid question. I, I don't expect anyone here to, um, to, to make it to. So, <laughs> OK. So, yeah, right now, now it's a challenge. Now somebody's going to now, now, now somebody's going to be like, "Could dark matter be made of bananas?" <laughs> but okay, so okay, before before we go into that, though, I just want to sort of briefly finish off the stuff that I was saying all too quickly at the very end of last lecture, where I said, "All right, beyond these simple paradigms of decay or annihilation, what what are the ways in which these arguments can break? What are the other things that can happen?" Well. Theorists and model buildings being very creative. There are many other ways to explain, besides thermorelic annihilation, to explain why we see the abundance of dark matter that we do. Here is a partial laundry list, which I encourage you to Google if you have a model that doesn't fit neatly into the thermal paradigm. I said yesterday you can have three to two annihilations. So the dark matter is abundance is depleted by d annihilations purely within the dark sector, or more generally, so more generally, you can have annihilations or decays that do not involve standard model particles at all. So, so if you look up SIMP models, they talk about there was a paper called the simp miracle and I think a later one called the simplest miracle so um, you can have you can have freeze-in as some people mentioned yesterday it's possible the dark matter was not originally in thermal equilibrium with the standard model and its interactions populated so the interactions with the standard model populated the dark matter rather than depleted it before freezing out at some point so here the dark matter density increases over time until these interactions freeze out. And there are various variations on this story. You have the axion cosmology that Maxime has been talking about, where the abundance is just set by some initial condition in, in the dark sector, some misalignment angle and the subsequent cooling. You can have late decays. Mention this briefly. Another species is produced this is not the dark matter of the universe, either by thermorelic production or by something else. And then later on, it decays into de it decays to make the dark matter. And so this is this is just this is just a partial this is just a partial list. There are there are more. Even if we stick, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I'll actually put on this list. Okay, but th there are also just modifications to thermal, to this thermal freeze-out story without being a wholly different paradigm. And there's a bit of sl sl um, there's a bit of um, room to move between this column and the other column, depending on how broadly you define thermal freeze-out. I heard, heard people talking about co-annihilation, and relatedly, there's semi-annihilation. So this is a situation where there are, co-annihilation is a situation where there are multiple interacting species involved. When you write down the Boltzmann equation, you have to write down coupled Boltzmann equations. For example, the dark matter might be able to annihilate against another species that's out there. In semi-annihilation, the situation is that you have multiple dark matter-like species, but that annihilate to another dark matter type particle and a standard model particle. So this could be. So in co-annihilation, you might have DMI and DMJ annihilations to standard model particles, as well as DMI to DMI. 
And it's worth mentioning, co-annihilation can both enhance or decrease the late time. So co-annihilation breaks the linkage between, to some degree between the cross-section at the time of freeze-out and the cross-section in the present day, because at the time of freeze-out, these additional species were around. In the present day, they've all decayed away. So you only have the dark matter alone. This can either increase or decrease the predicted present day cross-section, basically depending on how the rates in these co-annihilation channels compared to the rates for just pure dark matter, dark matter annihilation, and whether these co-annihilating species decayed into the dark matter or not. Yeah? Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'd call it, I'd call it co-annihilation if the particles that you're producing at the end are all standard model particles, and I'd call it semi-annihilation if there are dark matter particles in the final state as well. But, I mean, you treat them both in a very similar way, which is you need to write down coupled Boltzmann equations for all the species that are interacting. But semi-annihilation, you know, you're only removing one dark matter particle for each such interaction. And, um, and, and, the, and the reverse reactions involve a dark matter particle as well. So if those dark matter particles are getting exponentially depleted, then the, re the reverse rate for this process will be different than for this process, because it depends on whether you have two particles in the thermal bath colliding, or one particle in the thermal bath and one heavy dark matter particle, which has an exponentially depleted abundance. Um, I, I, well, yeah, so I'm using semi-annihilation fairly generally to just mean a, a, pro, a process that gives you dark matter, you know, a process of annihilation that gives you dark matter particles in the final state. I guess in the initial paper, they yeah. focused on the Z3 symmetry case. Yeah, yeah. So, so I may be using semi-annihilation too broadly, but but this but this general idea that your annihilation. But yeah. So I really want to say one of the possible variations is this general idea that you could have dark matter particle, a dark matter particle in the final state as well. But may, may, maybe okay. Okay, what's written? Okay, all I'm sorry. Co-annihilation. Co-annihilation. You're typically talking about a case where you have multiple interacting species. The dark matter can, which I'm going to call DMI and DMJ for these purposes, but only one of these is the eventual dark matter of the universe. The other one is a species that the dark matter can interact with and annihilate against in the early universe, but in the present day, it's not there. Okay. So that means that this channel is open in the early universe. It's not open at late times. That can mean that can suppress your indirect detection signal. But if this channel, um, if you know three quarters of the dark matter was in this species and the rate for this is really small compared to just DMJ DMJ annihilation, then the rate can actually be larger at late times because you have more DMJ. So that's the, so the thing that I was calling semi-annihilation, and the classic semi-annihilation is one example of this is a case where, like the simple annihilation, it's not uh, the dark matter abundance is being depleted, but in a process that creates other dark matter particles at the same time. So this is a situation where every such annihilation only removes one dark matter particle from the bath, and the reverse reactions are reactions of dark matter particles on standard model particles. So these are examples of how of basically, to, to analyze such situations, you would write down a modified Boltzmann equation that deals with all these coupled species. And there are various other modifications in this general vein. I, I should also mention that, I mean, there's sort of an, an, another, maybe I'll put it in this column. Another possibility in this, common, in this column is that you have asymmetric dark matter. So thermal freeze out proceeds largely as normal, but what eventually sets the abundance is not the interactions freezing out. Before the interactions freeze out, you run out of anti-dark matter. In this case, so this is a case where you have both dark matter and anti-dark matter. You could think about it as like a species of co-annihilation where you have different dark matter species, but the dark matter can only inter annihilate with the anti-dark matter and vice versa. If you have less anti-dark matter than dark matter, just as you do for the baryons, then you run out of anti-dark matter that um, prevents the further depletion of the dark matter species. So in this case, 
This is sort of an extreme case of co-annihilation where the channel that was open in the early universe is the only channel for annihilation, and it's closed completely in the present day if you don't have any way of repopulating that anti-dark map. So that situation kills present day indirect detection signatures altogether unless there's some mechanism in the theory that repopulates the, uh, that repopulates the anti-dark matter. The other perhaps kind of simplest modification to thermal freeze out we talked about briefly yesterday, but it's just the case where there's some additional velocity dependence in this sigma v parameter. And there are two very common ways that this can happen. One is where the annihilation is dominated by higher partial waves. So in general, we can write that In general, we can write an expansion for sigma v that looks something like this, with terms with successively higher powers of v squared. This part gets a contribution only from the S wave piece, so orbital angular momentum, orbit angular momentum equal to zero. This second term gets a contribution from um, L equals zero and L equals one. This third term gets a contribution from L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two, and so on. So if for some reason annihilation from the L equals zero state is forbidden, then that gives you velocity suppressed, uh, then that gives you a velocity suppressed cross section. And this can happen, for example, for Majorana fermions annihilating to, for a Majorana fermion LSP annihilating uh, through the weak interactions to light fermions. This is, this happens pretty frequently. So it's one of the reasons, like in the, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, the, um, it's not infrequent to have pretty suppressed annihilation cross sections as a result of this. So Wimp Miracle actually doesn't always work in the MSSM. And this is one of the reasons. So if the annihilation from L equals zero is forbidden or highly suppressed, then sigma v is suppressed at low v. At freeze out, we said last time that the temperature at freeze out is about a 20th of the dark matter mass. So it frees out v squared is an order 0.1 effect. But for example, for the purposes of those CMB constraints that I showed you yesterday, v squared v can be about 10 to the minus 8. So v squared is about 10 to the minus 16. So if you have a P wave suppression, there is not going to be any impact on the CMB. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, I think I think it's just, I mean, because I mean, really, like V's V's a vector, right? So it can, it, I mean, it has to depend on V dot V. So you're asking, like, why, why didn't you have a square root? Why, yeah, what, why, why in this expansion do you never get a square root V dot V term? Um, so I don't know a great explanation for this besides, like, I mean, if you, so, I mean, the reason that the higher partial waves are suppressed is because, uh, you can think of it just in classical scattering, um, higher partial waves have higher, impact per, have higher impact parameters. The annihilation process, this assumes that the annihilation process is very short range. So higher partial waves means higher impact parameter. The particles go by at a larger distance from each other. They're, they're if, especially if you're going at high velocity. Yeah, so, right. So uh, essentially this, this, acts as a centrifugal barrier to to the annihilations and you need a high velocity to overcome that centrifugal barrier so um but yeah but but i mean and and if you and if you and if you work out and if you work out you know the height of that centrifugal barrier what velocity and um and how this scales with velocity then you find that it goes like v, v to the 2l um but aside from yeah i mean do you,
Yeah, right. But yeah, I, I mean, that, that's why there can't be any dependence, I know, like there can't be any dependence on V, the vector. Um, I mean, in principle, I suppose you could have a fractional power dependence on V squared, but um, in, 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 pra in, pra in practice, you don't. Um, I, like, in, in, pr in principle, you have, could have some dependence, which was like V squared to the 0 0.7, right? I mean, so long as it only depends on the magnitude, then I don't think it's ruled out. But uh, yeah, in, in, I mean, you, you can just see like the centrifugal barrier scales like L times L plus one over R squared. If you just let's solve the Schrodinger equation with that potential, you'll see what, that you get the integer dependences on V for the scaling towards the origin. Yes, that, yes, true. Yeah, you can probably make an argument from analyticity. Anyway, yeah, so for the CMB, if this suppression is in place, there's essentially no effect at all. And in the present day halo, the typical velocity of dark matter particles is about, is comparable to the rotational velocity of the Milky Way, which is about 10 to the minus three times C. So this is about a 10 to the minus six suppression. So the effect on freeze out of having dominantly P wave annihilations is, I mean, it means that the high velocity cross section has to be somewhat larger, but not by a huge factor. But in the present day, indirect detection signals will be damped quite, quite markedly. You can also go in the other direction. You can also go in the other direction and drop the assumption that the annihilation cross-section, that the, the, the interactions that give rise to annihilation are purely short range. If you have a long range attractive interaction between dark matter particles, where long range here just means of a scale, um, of the mass scale smaller than, significantly smaller than alpha times the mass of the dark matter, then that long range attractive potential will enhance the annihilation rate. So if I, have, uh, if I have an attractive force between the dark matter particles that's mediated by something with mass A and, um, and coupled to the dark matter with a characteristic coupling alpha, then in this range of velocities, if this range exists, if MA is small enough, then you can get an order one over V enhancement to the overall annihilation rate if it's, if it's S wave. And then for V less than this mass cutoff, the enhancement saturates. And it becomes just order of so um, the reason why this so the reason why this is a low velocity is enhancement is that effectively if you have a long range attractive potential between two particles, it's important when the potential energy from that potential is large relative to the kinetic energy of the particles. If they're going fast, they just fly past each other. They don't care about the potential. If they're going slowly, the potential can significantly enhance their chances of interacting. Question back? There was a question back there? Okay, the question is, would this long range force cause the collapse of a halo into, into a dark disk? Uh, if it's strong enough, then, yeah, if, if it's sufficiently strong, then I think you also need dissipative interactions, not just elastic interactions, to cause the collapse of a halo into a dark disk. But if sufficiently strong, these kinds of interactions, as well as enhancing annihilation, can also have s significant effects on the small scale structure of halos. Um, I guess Manoj probably talked somewhat about self interacting dark matter in, in his lectures. So this is the same thing, it's just the statement that. Um, 
but, but it is possible to have significant enhancements to annihilation in regimes where you don't expect any significant effect on substructure. And it's possible to have significant self-interactions, but still no annihilation, as in the case, for example, of asymmetric dark matter. Yeah, so the, the dark disk models, um, Lisa Randall and Matt Rees at Harvard have worked, they have a series of paper on, papers on this. The idea is basically if some subcomponent of the dark matter is not weakly interacting and is quite strongly interacting, then it could form into a disk similar to the baryonic disk, and it wouldn't be ruled out by limits on self-interaction because they don't really significantly constrain the possibility that a small fraction of the dark matter has strong self-interactions. They just say that most of the dark matter does not. Uh, I think you need a dissipate. Yeah, I think you need a dissipative element to get this to work. That's it. They're, they're not my papers. I might be wrong about this. If somebody else has written a paper on it and um, disagrees with that, then you should speak up. But at least in the early papers, they needed a dissipative. They needed some dissipative interaction. I think they had light, dark. Um, I, I think they had like very light, dark photons around, forming a bath that the dark matter could scatter off. Is there a question here? Okay. Okay, so these are just, a cut. so if some of our enhancement is in play, that can greatly enhance indirect detection signals in the present day. So whenever we see, you see a signal that, is much, that looks like a potential dark matter signal, but is much bigger than you might have expected, then you can potentially invoke some of our enhancement to explain it. However, again, as we said, the velocity at the time of the CMB is much smaller than the velocity in the present day halo. So if you invoke some of our enhancement to explain a signal that you see in the present day, you have to be careful that you don't violate bounds from the early universe or for other systems where the velocity is much lower. The nice thing about indirect detection is we have many different we have many different objects to look at. So in principle, if you were to see something that needed a funny velocity dependence, you could try to cross check it in other systems. Okay. So that said, and 25 minutes into my lecture, I would like to go on and talk about all right. What, what are the signals that you can see in the present day? Stepping away now from the question of how did the dark matter get there, although still using that as guidance, when we want to look to the dark matter annihilation or decay or semi-annihilation or co-annihilation or scattering or de-excitation in the present day, what do we need, what do we look for? Okay, so if we have, so now we're saying, okay, we have some dark matter annihilation or decay. So this could be dark matter annihilation, dark matter decay, something else. There is some interaction that we don't know about. And then it produces standard model particles. These could be, there could be more than two of these in principle. But these standard model particles will subsequently decay. And you will end up with a collection of stable standard model particles, which are neutrinos, electrons, protons, antiprotons, and photons. So, standard model products. So the question is now, not actually knowing what's on this side of the picture, how can we measure these things? What do we want to look for for dark matter annihilation signals? And how could we use the properties of these observed particles to infer information about the fundamental physics that couples to the dark matter, the standard model, and the nature of the dark matter itself? So. Now, so it's worthwhile at this point dividing up these particles into a couple of different categories. And Perhaps the, the most important in how you do the search is neutral products versus charged products. So on the neutral side, we have photons and neutrinos. On the charged side, we have, we have electrons and positrons, protons and antiprotons and possibly heavier nuclei. These can be produced in principle, just their branching ratios tend to be pretty small. So the, okay. so the key distinction between these two is that neutral particles travel in straight lines, whereas charged particles 
um, propagate in a mag we live inside a galaxy. That means we live inside a galactic magnetic field. That means that whenever we're dealing with charged particles, we need to understand the effects of the magnetic field and how they lose energy upon their propagation. Whereas neutrinos additionally have essentially no scattering. There's not much out there in the galaxy that forms a meaningful screen to neutrinos. Photons can be absorbed, so you do sometimes have to take into account absorption. But at some energies, at many of the energies that we look at, at least for galactic signals, that absorption is actually very small. So we can basically treat photons like neutrinos. They just come to us straight from the annihilation, and they point back. So because they travel in straight lines, this means they point back toward the annihilation or decay. Whereas this is not the case for, for charged particles. So this in turn means that for photons and neutrinos, we can make predictions about the spatial distribution of the signals that we see. And if we do see some interesting looking excess of photons or neutrinos, we can use spatial information to try to determine did it come from dark matter? And if so, what was the distribution of that dark matter? So let's first talk about the neutral sector. OK, so suppose I tell you, all right, I have a model for dark matter that predicts a certain annihilation cross-section, which may or may not be dependent on velocity. For the moment, let's assume that sigma v is constant. And I want to know where I should point my telescope and what kind of effect I, I should expect to see. Now, in, in general, the telescopes that we have here on Earth do not look at the whole sky at the same time. At, um, in la last time, when we were doing quick estimates of how many photons would you expect to see, we just integrated over the whole solid angle. But in general, we'll want, to out we'll want the ability to look at a particular location. OK. So in general, so the observable quantity for particles that travel in straight lines is typically an integral along some line of sight of all the products from dark matter annihilations along that line of sight. So, which is to say, in general, we have only a 2D view of the sky. We're interested in the projection of the dark matter signal on that 2D view. So we might want to ask, for example, what is, so given a telescope with effective area A, viewing a solid angle d omega. We'd like to ask from a given distribution of dm, what is the rate of photons or neutrinos arriving at the telescope? I'm going to say photons throughout here just so I don't have to say photons or neutrinos every time. But unless I specifically say this applies only to photons, everything I say here will apply to neutrinos too. So this is just going to be the very slightly sophisticated version of the quick estimates, very slightly more sophisticated version of the quick estimates that we did last time.
Okay. So our situation here, over here we have the Earth. On the Earth we have a telescope pointing at the sky. It has some effective area A and it's looking at a solid angle. We'll call it D omega. It has a collecting area, an effective collecting area of area A. And we want to know, all right, how many photons are going to hit this telescope from dark matter anywhere in this solid angle? So we'll describe this by a, D, by a dark matter mass distribution. Okay, because typically we can't constrain the dark matter number density directly. We can only constrain the dark matter mass density because that's what gravitates. Yes. This is a fairly trivial diagram, but yes, I, I can draw it bigger. Here is the Earth, nice large Earth. Here is on the Earth our, our telescope. I can't draw telescopes, but okay, we have a telescope. The telescope has a collecting area of A. Is this large enough for people to see? Yeah. Okay, we have a telescope of collecting area A. The telescope, from this telescope we are measuring we are observing everything within some solid angle, d omega. Okay. In this solid angle, I have some density distribution of dark matter, which is a 3D density distribution in principle. Okay. But all I can, all I'm going to see at the Earth though, is how many photons from this density distribution hit this mirror, or this telescope, or this, you know, this uh, detect this. Um, set of silicon strips, whatever, at, at any moment in time. I can also probably measure their energy. So um, if you're not dealing with redshifting, then the energy of photons doesn't really change as it propagates to us. So I'm going to, for the moment, ignore redshifting, just think about a local source, and just look at the number of photons that are coming in, and the spectrum will be exactly the same as it was at the source. OK? OK, so to answer this question, Let's, um, let's, for the moment, consider the case where this is a, um, yeah, let, okay, how do I want to do this? You know, th this is, this is okay, as is. Okay, so I want to know what is D, the number of photons arriving at my telescope per unit time. Okay, so first we want to, so let's take some small, let, let's take some small patch out here. Let's just, get, let's again consider just a ring and say, all right, annihilation, so annihilations in this ring, we'll say that this ring is a distance r from the center. And I want to know contribution from this ring. And then I'll, int and then I'll integrate over all such rings. Okay? So, so we'll put a dr here, and then we want to know the contribution, the contribution from an individual ring. Now, just as we said yesterday, if I have an individual, so okay, if I have an individual dark matter annihilation somewhere in this ring, then the fraction of events that I will see from that annihilation is going to be the area of my detector divided by 4 pi r squared. Okay? Because from this point here, the from this annihilation point here, the products are going to spread out in all directions. At a given distance r from the additional annihilation, they're going to be spread out over a sphere of surface area 4 pi r squared. Only A of that area has my telescope in it. Okay? So I have a ratio 4 pi r squared. So this is the fraction of events at reach detector. Then I want to factor for, okay, how many events do I actually have per annihilation? I'll just call this m bar gamma, okay? So this is photons per annihilation. Okay, oh, then we know, okay, for each of those photons per annihilation, some fraction of them hits the detector. So then 
we, this fraction of them hits the detector. So then we just need to, um, so then we just need to multiply by how many actual dark matter annihilations there are in this ring. Okay, so the number of actual dark matter annihilations in this ring is going to be. Um, so actually, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have put the dr in already. I'm going to integrate over. Okay, the number of dark matter annihilations occurring in this ring per unit time is going to be, as we said last time, the volume element, so because this is the annihilations per unit volume per unit time. Multiply by the volume element, this gives me annihilations per unit time. Then this gives me, this factor gives me the photons per unit time. This tells me the fraction of the photons that I'm going to see that will ever reach my detector. Is everyone cool with this? Sorry? N yes, n is, yes, n, n is number density, right. So, okay, so then let's, so that dv, Yeah, good. So I'm not right. Yeah. So I'm not including that here at the moment. If I wanted to include that here, then I would also need to put in a factor for um, for the absorption of the photons. So if I wanted to include absorption, then I would have to put in something like e to the minus. Um, yeah. So so I mean, if if I know, for example, that they have a certain that they have a certain path length, then you know I'd have something like. E, e, e the minus r over lambda, okay? If I wanted to include absorption, it was just following a certain path length. If I had a, and in general, if I had a, you know, my path length depends on what region of the sky I'm looking at, then this would be, this would be a function of r as well, okay? So if I, now, if I wanted to also include, you know, I mean, maybe my photons can be absorbed and re-emitted or something, then this would be a bit more complicated, <laughs> but, but if I just want to include absorption in the first order, I would do something like this. Okay. So, the, so this dv, well, we know what the volume element in spherical coordinates is. So this is just r squared dr d omega. The say, I mean, this is the volume of the ring that we're looking at. This n squared dm equals rho dm over the dark matter mass. Okay, so this r squared factor here, the fact that the rings get bigger as you move out, is going to cancel out this one over r squared factor, the fact that you see a smaller fraction of the photons from each event as you move further out. So this, in the end, is going to give you, let's see what I can do here, a on, Sigma B squared. But okay, I don't think I've forgotten any factors here. We we okay? Okay. Uh, I forgot a bar. Uh, I forgot an n gamma. Yes, good. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, so now, but but okay. but the only term in this expression that depends on the, at least if we're assuming that sigma v is a constant, the only term in here that you actually need to integrate over is this dark matter density squared. So we can separate this into a factor which is A, so this is detector. Yeah, yeah so, th so this is the total number of annihilations per unit time in the, in, the ring, er, in the ring volume that I'm looking at, okay? Uh, so the factor of two, we talked about this, we talked about this a little bit last time, that if you assume that these particles are all identical, then, um, and I, you can just imagine, suppose I have n particles in a box, and I want to make pairs of them. How many distinct, n indistinguishable particles, like n, n identical particles, how many possible pairs are there? 
there are n times m minus 1 divided by 2 because the ordering of the particles in the pair doesn't matter. Okay? So that, that's, that's where the factor of 2 comes from. You often see it... Um, now, if we, then, if we ask what is the power injection, every annihilation annihilates twice the dark matter mass. So you get, um, so you get 2m chi per annihilation. So the power injected is just the dark matter mass times sigma v times ndm squared with no factors of 2. But um, yeah, the, if, if the factor of 2, if, this was, if the dark matter was like half dark matter and half anti-dark matter, and dark matter would only annihilate against anti-dark matter, then, um, then you wouldn't have this factor of 2. But what you would have instead is um, you know, n over 2 of the dark matter can annihilate with the other n over 2. So you get a factor of like n squared over 4 if n is the total dark matter plus anti-dark matter density. But yeah, it's, the, the factor of 2 is just avoiding double counting between pairs of dark matter particles. Okay, so we have this area A, which just depends on our detector. We have a particle physics piece, which is the annihilation cross-section, the dark matter mass, and the number of photons per annihilation. This will come out of your model or your run of Pythia, whatever you want to do. And then we have this integral with an a pi out the front. Okay, so let's check that I didn't lose any factors here. But um, yeah, so, so basically this is the particle piece. This is what your dark matter model tells you about. But then this integral holds all the information that you have about the dark matter distribution and the astrophysics. And you can have two totally different dark matter distributions, but if they give the same result to this integral, they will look perfectly identical from the perspective of your photon telescope, your neutrino telescope. Sorry? So if I oh sorry so n, n, n gamma here is the number of photon is the number of n gamma here with a bar is just the number of photons per annihilation right so the question was am I looking for the disappearance of photons or anything nope I'm just looking for the dark matter particles out there will annihilate remember that most of the dark matter particles are not annihilating annihilation does not you you can what we said last time we were use, using the simple scaling relationships we had last time. By the epoch of the CMB, in the smooth density, about 1 in 10 to the 10 dark matter particles were, were annihilating. By the present day, out between the halos, the, the ratio was much smaller again. It's like 1 in 10 to the 16 dark matter particles annihilates. Now, locally, we have a overdensity of about 10 to the 6 over the cosmological dark matter density. But still, in our galaxy, about if dark matter is 100 GeV wimp, thermal wimps, about 1 in 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 of the dark matter particles in our halo will ever have annihilated over the whole lifetime of the universe. So we're not seeing dark matter disappear from these regions, except at an extremely slow rate. What we were looking for is when dark matter particles annihilate or decay, photons are produced either directly or through more frequently through the decay of particles produced in that annihilation. And then we're just asking the question of how many, if I put a telescope up in, say, up in orbit around the Earth, and I, um, and, I, and I leave it up there and I ask how many photons do I see that come from dark matter annihilation, then this is, then this is, the, then this is the result for unit time. This is the particle component, and this piece tells you about the astrophysical distribution of dark matter. So it is a very common thing in the field to define what's called the J-factor, where J um, is just given by this integral. So this is the integral, so this is the J factor for annihilation. And 
So this is independent of the particle physics model, except that in deriving it, we have tacitly assumed that sigma v is a constant. Okay? So if you have a particle physics model where that's not true, you can't you just use these j factors out of the box. You need, for example, if you had P wave suppression or some of enhancement of the cross section, then there would be an additional factor in here, which was a factor of V squared or a factor of one over V, and that could also depend on the location. But in most of the constraints that you see, the assumption will be that sigma V is constant everywhere. This, then this allows us to make statements about what is the best target to look at and by what factor, how many photons do I expect to see from the dwarf satellites of the Milky Way as compared to the galactic center, as compared to a cluster, without making any statements about the details of the dark matter physics, what does the dark matter annihilate to, so on. So of course, it doesn't tell us about the backgrounds in those areas. This is purely telling us about the signal side of the equation, not signal over background or signal over square root background. Now, similarly, for decay, we could do we can do the same we can do the same kind of thing. Um, for decay, it's essentially the same calculation, except that you would instead of having a factor of rho squared, you would only have a factor of you would only have a factor of the dark matter density. And again, this is the astrophysics that controls um, that, that controls how large a signal you can see. Yeah, the difference between eight pi and four pi is yeah, the, yeah. I mean, of course, this is pure like I mean, this is purely a convention whether you define it with a factor of two or a factor of four or a factor of pi, and so long as you're consistent between different objects, um, and and you use the j factor appropriately when putting it into an equation like that. I mean, the left hand side of that equation is the physical observable. What I choose to call part of the j factor versus part of the particle physics. It doesn't matter where I put the factors of two so long as I do it self consistently. Okay, so let's now. So okay, so when people talk about J factors in in indirect notation, this is what they. What are some some examples of J factors? So if I look at a region within. So if I look at say a region of one degree radius around the galactic center. So remember, like, I'm not looking at just the annihilation from the galactic center itself now. I'm looking at all the annihilation on the line of sight between me and the galactic center. Then the J factor that I find for that field of view, taking a simple estimate for the dark matter density towards the center, assuming an NFW-like profile, so that's a navarro frank white profile, right? it's like one of R towards the center, I find a J factor of about 10 to the 22 GV squared centimeters to the minus five for, for, an, for annihilation. I mean, we can, uh, we can just, um, I mean, we, we, can, we can estimate what that would mean in terms of seeing, in terms of seeing a signal. This isn't in my notes, so I'll do it on the fly. Um, so suppose we had, again, we had sigma v of 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, okay? And I'll have m chi b, I know, do you want 10 GV, 100 GV? Let's make it 100 GV series. Okay, so I'm going to take this J factor. I'm going to multiply it by sigma v divided by m chi squared. So that's going to be 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second divided by 10 to the 4 GV squared. So that's going to be like 10 to the, um, so that's going to be like 10 to the minus 30. Um, centimeters cubed per second per GV squared. So this is going to give me like 10 to the minus 8 photons, 10 to the minus 8 per square centimeter per second. Okay. So if I've got a, um, so if I've got a, feel free to write this down on a piece of paper as well. So 10 to the minus 8 per square centimeter per second. So 
the area, you suppose the area of my telescope is about one square meter. That's about right, right for the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, okay? So that's 10 to the four square centimeters, okay? So that gives me 10 to the minus four photons per second, okay? Fermi's been up there for eight years. So that's about 10 to the eight seconds, okay? So that predicts 10,000 photons, well, or 10,000, well, 10,000 multiplied by n gamma bar divided by eight part, uh, sorry, yeah, 10,000 photons multiplied by the number of photons per annihilation is how many photons you would expect to see from the galactic center using Fermi over eight years. Okay? So that's how we use, that's how we use J factors. So, um, okay, so that, that sounds good. 10,000 photons is a, is a nice number. I, of course, the problem that you run into, there are two problems that you run into here. One is backgrounds, as we'll talk about in sig significantly more detail tomorrow. Um, the, the other issue, though, is this number is quite uncertain. So this assumes rho proportional to this assumes rho following this profile, where now r means distance from the galactic center not distance from Earth. I'll put a G in there ju just to remind you of that. So this is like a, so this is a one over R cusp towards the center of the Milky Way. And if this is true, then looking straight at the galactic center is absolutely the most sensitive way to look for signals of dark matter annihilation. Um, but it might not be true. I'm sure, I wasn't here for Minocha's lectures, but I'm sure he told you about the core cusp problem, about hints of cores in smaller galaxies. So searches at the galactic center have the potential to be extremely sensitive. We definitely want to do them because there's the potential to see a very impressive signal. But if you don't see anything, like if you look at the galactic center with Fermi and you don't see 10,000 photons that look like they could be dark matter annihilation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can rule out 100 GeV thermorelic dark matter annihilating through those channels because it might be just that the dark matter density in the center is much lower than we think it is. We don't have solid observational bounds on the dark matter density really much inward of the position of the sun. Okay. So on. But in general, don't we know the mass, isn't the mass fixed? So even if those less it's more, wouldn't it still be more on the outside? So okay, so the question is, isn't the, you know, isn't the total mass within some radius fixed? Um, the total, no, no, sorry. Not radius, but with, with the entire thing. Or we, would, I thought we, would, we would know that, I would think. So we're, we're, we're pretty far away from the center. Of the center so. Right. So we know pretty well, we know at least moderately well, the the total mass in the Milky, the total mass of the Milky Way, and the total mass within, uh, and, and even the total mass within a certain radius of the center of the Milky Way. The problem is that if you look at the total mass of the Milky Way, most of it is nowhere near the center. I mean, our, our halo, the virial radius of our halo, is 200 kiloparsecs. The dark matter halo extends out a long way past the Earth. And most of the mass in the halo is not towards the center. Um, just because the density is higher, the volume integral is much smaller. Now, you, you can, and when you try to get a handle on the total mass inside some region, towards the center, most of the mass is baryons. So you can measure the total mass, but if you want to infer the total dark matter mass, you have to subtract off a large number from a large number to try to measure a small number. And it's very hard to do. At the moment, as I understand it, the observational constraints are, are from the radius of the Earth, the dark matter density profile could be rising like r to the minus 1.5 towards the center. That's consistent with observations. It could also be completely flat in one of the solar circle. Um, so if you're looking within about one degree of the galactic, of the galactic center, that's sort of of order um, 150 parsecs. So it's probably about a factor of, um, it's like a factor of 70 in one of the center to us. So the difference between that being out of the zero and out of the minus 1.5 is, is not negligible, right? I mean, it, it can be, it, I mean, you can get, you have uncertainties of factors of, at this radius, I think it's probably an uncertainty of a factor of a few hundred between just having a core and having a steep profile, just from that. And for annihilation also goes like density squared, so it may actually be larger. Um, if you look in the really tiniest regions around the galactic center, the uncertainties can be many orders of magnitude. Okay, so, so the other region that many, the constraints, the perhaps the most robust constraints 
from our galaxy come from are the dwarf galaxies. So for the dwarf galaxies though, the J factor for the dwarf galaxies in the same units is between, at least the dwarf galaxies that we used for this, is between about 10 to the 17 and 10 to the 20. And that's where we said the galactic center was, um, was, was, t was 10 to the 22. And suddenly you're down from 10,000 photons over the lifetime of Fermi to 100 photons over the lifetime of Fermi, which is a much harder signal to see. Yeah? Not the same, yeah, the question is, does it assume the same angular extent, or is it? Uh, right, so the J factor for, yeah, so that, no, the J, so the, the, ma the question was, does the J factor for the dwarfs assume the mass density, the same mass density as the galactic center? The mass density in the dwarf galaxies is very different to the mass density of the galactic center. These estimates um, often assume an NFW-like profile for the dwarfs individually, so then this R here is, distance from the center of the dwarf, not distance from the center of the galaxy. But, um, but that uncertainty is much less pronounced for the dwarfs because this is not within some small distance from the center of the dwarf. This is integrated over the whole dwarf halo. This is kind of making a, um, a virtue out of necessity because for a telescope like Fermi, it's quite hard. The, the dwarfs are not much bigger than a point source. The angular extent of the dwarfs on the sky is generally around the degree scale or subdegree, and that's comparable to the angular resolution of Fermi. But the advantage about, so that makes them less sensitive to signals from the very center of the dwarfs. But the advantage is that it also makes these results quite insensitive to what you assume for the details of the dwarf density profile towards the center. The difference between a chord profile and an NFW profile for dwarfs is about a 20% difference in the J factor. Yeah, okay, so the question is, is the effect of like, the fact that we're sitting inside a dark matter halo negligible or not? Um, it, when you're looking at the galactic center, the effect of the region of dark matter immediately around us is pretty small. Um, when you're looking at a dwarf, I think it's also fairly small, but anytime you do a study of extra galactic objects like clusters, it, it can be true that just the halo that surrounds us is actually a bigger contribution. That said, sometimes um, you can't get at the contribution from the halo that surrounds us because the high energy telescopes do on off analyses, look at the, you know, look at the target and then look off to the side. If you have an almost isotropic contribution from the dark matter all around us, it will just get rolled into the background and subtracted. Okay, now uh, I realize we are coming quite close to the end of this time. So, so let me, but that, I mean, Questions are great. Well, let me just move, move on. All right. So if you're designing, so if you're designing a search, these are the trade-offs you need to make. You need to work out the J factor for the targets that you would look at. For galaxy clusters, typically have similar J factors to the dwarf galaxies. They're much larger, but they're also much further away. However, there's um, if there was a great deal of substructure in the dwarf galaxies, small scale dark matter halos that can potentially boost up their annihilation factor to higher values, but it's not a robust, the, the galaxy clusters can potentially have higher J factors, but that's a theoretical uncertainty that we don't really have pinned down. So once you know what target you want to look at and what its J factor is, so you have an estimate of roughly, you know, roughly how many photons you could expect to see for a given annihilation rate, a very given time, you need to have 
either a particle physics model or some idea for the spectrum for what you want to look for. So what are the possibilities for the particle physics side of this picture? So again, so for particle physics, so, so dn, de, dt observed, so the number of photons per unit energy per unit time observed, if you don't need to worry about redshifting, is just going to be, it's going to be a times this j factor, which doesn't depend on your particle physics model, times sigma v over m pi squared. Okay. So what are the options for this spectrum at annihilation? Now, given a dark matter model, you can predict this precisely, but often when you're doing a search, you would like to try to be as model independent as possible. So what people tend to do instead is consider all possible two-body final states, standard model final states, and what photon spectrum they would produce. So you might consider annihilation into B quarks or W bosons or Z bosons or light fermions and ask as these particles decay, what, what photons do they make? What kind of shape of a spectrum should we be looking for? And when you do this exercise, you find that the purposes of photons, they're really sort of three types of spectra that you care about. Well, three types of spectra that have markedly different behavior, but um, and that you have to treat very differently. But within the categories, you can apply similar approaches. So these three broad categories One, you might call hadronic, because most of the channels that give rise to this sort of signature are hadronic. This gets, so this might be annihilation into quarks, either heavy or light. You can also get similar spectra for annihilation into the heavy gauge bosons. And to some degree, for tau plus, tau minus, although this is kind of borderline. So, 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 what this, so what this gives you, so such channels give you many continuum photons. So give you, so they give you a smooth, So they give you a smooth spectrum. The spectrum usually looks broadly if we type plot the power per logarithmic interval on this axis and the energy on this axis. Schematically, the spectrum will be a broad bump, will be a broad bump at a scale determined by the dark matter mass, not a lion. And an order one fraction of the total power in the annihilation ends up going into these photons. Typically, the channel is that pi naughts are produced and then pi naught decays to gamma gamma with a 99% branching ratio. So basically, this is one class of channels such that your annihilation makes a lot of neutral pions. Then the second possibility is leptonic. You annihilate to E plus E minus or mu plus 
mu minus O. And here I do actually mean here photons means photons, not neutrinos. <laughs> Pinots do not annihilate into neutrinos at 99 at so, so this is now a state so this is now a statement about photon telescopes. So the purpose of photon searches is how you can classify things. Electronic channels you annihilate to electrons or muons. These channels don't natively provide any prompt photons. Um, you know, like the, this two-body state doesn't have any prompt photons in it, and it won't provide any prompt photons by decay. But you can get photons from three-body states. This gives you a hard spectrum peaked very close to the dark matter mass for the photon spectrum. However, the amplitude of this peak is typically rather small. It's a small fraction of the total power in the annihilation. If you are looking for a photon signal from such channels, often where most of the power comes from is actually from the is actually from scattering of the electrons on of the electrons on um, positron products on the background interstellar radiation field. So such channels, the signal, the photon signal that can dominate. So this is a loss mechanism for those electrons and positrons, but this is more complicated to model because these charged particles will propagate through the galaxy and the galactic magnetic field, losing energy as they go. So to understand this kind of signal from such channels, you need to understand how cosmic rays behave. The third channel As exemplify is the channel that everyone would love to see, would be beautiful, and that is to see a gamma ray lion or a very narrow box signal. So this, you would get this with annihilation direct to gamma gamma, but because dark matter is not charged, the cross section for this process is typically quite small. So, so, in this, so I'll just sketch, so for the spectrum for the leptonic case, might for the FSR spectrum, might be like this, and then plus the lion case what you were looking at is a spectrum that is just a delta function of the DM mass. And then there are various models featuring decay to some other particle, that annihilation of some other particle that subsequently decays, or um, some near degeneracy in the spectrum that can likewise give rise to similar spectral features that are narrow boxes, close to the dark matter mass or close to some characteristic scale. Um, this would be a smoking gun signal if we could see it. But the rate is typically expected to be quite low, such that if we saw a signal like this, we would have expected to see one of the preceding continuum signals beforehand. So, yeah, good. Yeah, so, okay, so the question is, yeah, right. So the question is, okay, doesn't the background look very close 
to that rough curve that I've drawn for the hadronic case? Yeah, so to some degree it does. It doesn't, it doesn't look exactly the same in that the astrophysical backgrounds are typically power laws, but they can be power laws with breaks. Yeah, and, and a sufficiently hard power law with a break indeed looks very, very much like that spectrum. Depends somewhat on what energy you're at. Um, about 50 GeV dark matter annihilating the B quarks has a break at a few GeV. Pulsars also happen to have a break at a few GeV. So in that case, there's a known population that has a bump in just the wrong place <laughs> to be a background. Um, if you're looking at things which have a break at 600 GeV, then there won't be a source population that has a known break at exactly that location. But yeah, in terms of how difficult is this to distinguish from a smooth astrophysical background, uh, it gets better as you go down. Unfortunately, in terms of the rate of photons that you expect to see in a way that you can cleanly theoretically predict, that goes down <laughs> as you move down. So it's a trade-off between these channels. Yep, question? Why is the rate smaller? Is it a model-dependent thing? For, for this last one? Yeah. As I say, so if you want dark matter to annihilate directly to photons, dark matter carries no electric charge. Can't couple directly to photons. It, it can't have a direct coupling to photons, so it needs to go through something else. You need you know, something like... You, you, need, you need, like, if you start out with neutral particles here, you need, you know, you need a loop that has charged particles in it so that you can, so, so, that, so that you can make gamma-gamma. You, you can sometimes do, like, if there are light charged particles in the spectrum, you can sometimes get this rate up higher than you would naively guess, but, um, but generically lines are hard to see. If you want to, if you're curious about ways to do this, a couple of years ago we had a hint at 130 GV Lion signal in Fermi data, which was much brighter than you would have naively expected it to be from the loop factor. So um, if you go and read the papers from around that time, you'll see a lot of theoretical creativity in how to get a Lion signal that is only slightly, so in how to see a Lion signal when you can't see the continuum signal, uh, in, in the sense that the Lion signal had to be only slightly fainter than the continuum. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it looks like, yeah, sadly, sadly, or, or this would be a very different talk. But um, yeah, this would all be about you know, how we discovered lions in the galactic center, and that told us that dark matter was 130 GV particle with the following couplings. But um, yeah, it was, that, that signal was sort of four to five sigma was the claim. It looks like what happened was that there was a systematic error in Fermi around the 130 GV scale which was sort of contributing maybe a couple of sigma to that, and then the rest was a statistical fluctuation. I mean, people had said it couldn't all be a systematic uncertainty in Fermi, because if you looked at other regions of the sky, you didn't see the signal anywhere near the same significance. But of course, you know, you, you, that a systematic like that, even if it's not responsible for the whole signal, it can still make a statistical fluctuation look bigger than it really is. So that seems to have been what happened. Yeah, it's really sad. There was, if you, there are some talks from a couple of years ago where if you look at the significance of the line over time, it rose steadily just like a signal right up until the discovery paper was published. And right, and right, and exactly at that point, it turns around and starts to go down again. So yeah, it was, it was very depressing. OK, so um, I believe that you guys have a coffee break to get to. So this is. <laughs> This is what this is most of what I need to this is most of what I wanted to say about photon and neutrino searches. We're going to see a lot of examples of specific examples of these, looking at the dwarf galaxies, looking at the galactic center, using these J's factors, seeing and constraining spectra of these different types next time. The one extra thing that we do need to talk about, but which I think I will talk about at the start of next time, is this part of the equation, the how do you look for the charged particles? coming out of dark matter annihilation. That's particularly important for these leptonic channels where you just don't really have very many direct photons. Your main handles are, your, your main handles are the cosmic rays and the particles scattered from the cosmic, and the photons scattered by the cosmic rays, which, me, which means you need to understand the cosmic rays. But the cosmic rays are also important because the ordinary astrophysical cosmic rays can also upscatter photons to high energies. They're also important as backgrounds for these gamma rays. So we, need, so we need to understand them. So this will be, so the start of next lecture, I will use the board and just talk you through quickly how cosmic rays diffuse in our galaxy, the sort of simple background between how we understand the behavior of cosmic rays in our galaxy. And then I will go on and show you the current constraints and results and how we subtract those backgrounds.
Thanks very much. So this part, we cannot actually measure it. I thought that we can actually determine the core. Yeah, not not at no at the so at the galactic center measuring the measuring the dark matter density towards the galactic center is really hard. Um, it's just.